Lord, we want to thank you. You really have, and you really are present with us this morning. We recognise that. We thank you for the time together. We thank you for the time in your presence. We pray now, Lord, as we look at your word, we really dive in and we come out changed. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, two weeks ago when we met, we looked at what? Who was here two weeks ago? Okay, what, what was the sermon about? Lord is a warrior. Lord is a warrior. God is a warrior. <laughs> You're right, but there's nobody shouting it all at once. One, two, three. Oh. You see up there, it's a little bit obvious. <laughs> so, one, two, three. Lord is a warrior. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. I know, Father. But today we're not, we're going back to Mark. Now I am not going to ask you to remember what we learnt from the last time in Mark because it was so last year. <laughs> Trust me, I'm full of them at the moment. A bit later on I get serious, don't worry about it. So a quick run through. The book of Mark is really, to me, a massive gospel of conflict. It shows me Jesus who is a warrior. He sort of has runs in with both the religious authorities, spiritual forces. He tackles sickness. He tackles his own disciples. Yes? He's not a shampoo advert Jesus, is he? No. Oh, good. We picked that up from two weeks ago. I ended uh, the last time we looked at Mark two places. We ended up in Mark. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry. I'd love to put it up on the screen. Works fine in, during the week. Decides to break this morning. Maybe it's got a leak. Right. Uh, we are going to be having serious chats about buying a new laptop. So we ended uh, this quote from, I ended this quote from, uh, it was in Mark chapter 3. We ended at, chapter, at verse 19 with the great quote, Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed him. And uh, we looked at various uh, details. I don't want to go into it too much, but I did end on this quote from Edwards. The, co the Apostolic Commission encompasses three elements of human experience. The relational, verbal, and behavioural. Discipleship is a matter of being with Jesus, of speaking his message, and of acting in his name by casting out demons and opposing evil. With regard to the third, acting, the behavioural, disciples are not simply defined by what they stand for, but also what they stand against. They are commissioned to confront demonic and evil powers, however they manifest themselves, and to confront them not only in thought and word, but in actions. Do you remember that? Uh, it's not, that is a quote I quoted from Edwards, and it's how we ended up with the fact, if you look at the Gospel of Mark and any of the Gospels, we within the West do this really great thing of doing good works, nothing wrong with them, the food banks, the, the, you know, caring for people, that's great. But we seem to sort of think that's enough with the gospel message. That's how we portray Jesus' gospel. And I'm saying, but there's more. There's more. There's the ability to heal. There's the ability to cast out demons. There's all of that. There's also social justice. Things that we need to stand against, not just stand for. We can all stand for Jesus, but he stand, stood against social injustice. You with me so far? So we're going to read on. And I'm going to go to chapter, verse 20, right through to 35. Uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Sorry if you're going to have to uh, go through your... But I want to read it in one hit, and there'll be a reason why. One time, Jesus entered a house, and the crowd began to gather again. Soon, he and his disciples couldn't find even time to eat. When his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. 
But the teachers of religious law, who had arrived from Jerusalem, said, He's possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. That's where he gets the power to cast out demons. Jesus called them over and responded with an illustration. How can Satan cast out Satan? He asked. A kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan is divided and fights against himself, how can he stand? He would never survive. Let me illustrate this further. Who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man like Satan and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger. Someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. I tell you the truth, all sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. He told them this because they were saying he's possessed by an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to him. They stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus, and what someone said, Your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Jesus replied, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he looked at those around him and said, Look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. <coughs> nice, easy teaching. So, we have what is commonly known in theological terms is the Markan sandwich. It's a style of writing that Mark wrote where it's a sandwich. And if you remember, I sort of described these sandwiches literally as a sandwich. There are two slices of bread. The two slices of bread in this sandwich are about Jesus' family reaction to him. And the filling of the sandwich, if you're a vegetarian, it's whatever you put in your filling. For me, it's a good slab of pastrami mayonnaise and lettuce. That filling is about the teachers of the religious law here and their reaction to Jesus. Both the bread and the filling are making a point. The point of the slices of bread are that there are those who should know better, but they are trying to be authoritarian in binding Jesus. Now, I realise that could mean two different things for people. When I'm talking about binding Jesus, they're trying to trap him into their mould and what they want. And the filling is about the authority of Jesus to bind Satan. Hence, the point of this sandwich is that both Jesus has authority to bind Satan... But Jesus' followers must not and should not try to bind Jesus. Do you remember when uh, Jesus went off into the lonely on his own in the early part of Mark? He went off on his own to pray. They went out to get him. Actually, what you get there is this concept that they actually went out to pursue him. And the Greek and the inference is they always went out to capture him, to pull him back in and say, come on, come back and do those miracles you were doing yesterday. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. I've come to go elsewhere. It's not just here. So, you know, it wasn't like they were really searching, seeking, oh, holy Jesus, we want to learn from you. It was more like, come on, miracle worker, Mr. Circus Act, let's pull you out. It's that sort of, and this is what might well be going on here again. So I have a question. How do we bind Jesus? How can we, today, bind Jesus' ministry? By our disbelief or unbelief. Yeah. Lack of faith. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, it's two. Yeah, you're right. Okay. I won't get cold. We bind him by um, saying he can't do this, he's not interested in that, and to get him to ask him to be involved in things. Thank you. Yep. 
Um, I bind him by not believing what he says about me that's true and I believe what lies I've, I've learned from childhood. You're not believing about your identity in him and when he says you are my child, that's it, that's it, yeah? Is that what you're getting at? I'm, I'm guessing, yeah. but yeah, okay. I'm not giving any way pastoral secrets from the net or something. Uh, not believing his power at work. Not believing his power at work, yes. Well. By not testing the prophecy and just asking him to bless it. Okay, by not testing some prophecy. Okay. There is another significant way. There's more than one, but there's one I want us to pull out on. By not taking him with us, what I mean is we're in a situation where he wants to work, but we're not thinking about him, we're not acting as we, he wants us to act. He's reliant on us to be his arms and legs and mouthpiece, and we're not. So we've kind of bound him, he can't work in that situation in the way that he wants to. Brilliant. By limiting his area of influence in our lives. Correct, by limiting his area of influence in our lives, yes. I'm not sure about this, but could it be also when we twist the, his words and try to say, oh, but it's written, Jesus said this, but we're not actually applying it in the right way. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, we can take something from the Bible, take it out deliberately, knowingly, out of context, and applying it to mainly get our own way. Yeah, that's um, it's one of my... John will be the last one. John, I'm going to have to have arrows pointing, which is the easiest route. It's like having a sat-nav, yes. I think, I think sometimes we have our own set of rules about how we should be. And if we keep those rules, we then think, because I've kept these rules, God is obligated to come and do what I want. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And then, we, and then we get fed up that he doesn't play ball. <laughs> Yeah, that's because he didn't want to play ball in the first, in the first place. 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 Right. No. <laughs> Absolutely, all very good. There is that whole, yeah, well, what can I say? There's the, for me, there was all of that, and that was being said in the mixture uh, there for me, is that one of the key things is we combine Jesus by our own selfish desires. may not like that idea, but we want God. As I said, I think, last two weeks ago, it's no good asking God to come and bless what you are doing. That's the wrong way. Misusing the Bible uh, to get your way, to quote it when you're in the middle of an argument, but actually you're deliberately misquoting it. Satan did that, strangely enough. Just thought I might mention that. He liked to misquote Psalm 91 to get his own way, to try and get Jesus to do something. So there's lots of ways. Unfortunately, we can bind Jesus. We can bind his ministry and what he's trying to do through his church. So let's carry on diving into this. I, the reason I'm doing it in large chunks is because we're not going to go verse by verse. But again, we note that they've entered a house, and it's probably Peter's house again. Again, the crowds have gathered again, but it's so busy this time, we're now told they can't even get time to eat. Wow, imagine that. Foregoing a meal for God's work. Now, that's actually not always a good thing here. We said, remember before, crowds in Mark, people crowding Jesus in, is not always a good thing. Because they're not leaving the freedom to do what needs to be done. They're, they're imposing what they want. So actually, by stopping him and the disciples from eating, probably not a good thing really, is it? You know, energy levels. I've got on, somebody's going to say, oh, but they just use the power of the Holy Spirit to keep them going. Yeah, but, you know, we're a God of, God of common sense as well. That's why he gave it to us. In verse 21, it states, When his family heard that what was happening, they tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. This first slice of bread, this is the first bit. This is showing something to do with Jesus' own family. 
But actually, it's a bit vague in the Greek. Depending on what interpretation you are, uh, what uh, uh, version you're looking at, they're not quite sure if what's being said is that some people think that Jesus was out of his mind, so they went and got his family, or it is his family that are saying he's out of his mind. It's a little bit, they're not quite sure what's being quite said here. But actually, it really doesn't make any odds, because actually it means you can insert yourself in there if you want to. At which point you're thinking, why would I say that Jesus is out of his mind? We'll come back to that later. But they clearly want to think that Jesus has gone a little bit la-la land. They want to stop him. And then we have the religious law teachers turning up, arriving from Jerusalem. Wow. They've sent in the big guns. Find out what Jesus is up to. And I love it. They're even worse. They've decided he's possessed by Satan. Now, why would you say that when there is demonic exorcisms going on? There's healing happening. There's good stuff. There's God stuff. Why would you suddenly, as a, as a godly religious teacher, turn around and say, well, it's Satan. He's possessed by Satan. He's doing all of this. Why? Because if they say it's by God, they've just given up all their power, all of their authority, all of their influence upon their own society. It's the only reason they've done it. It's, it's no for other reason. It's purely human pride that has kicked in massively. What, this lonely little rabbi stuck out from the backwater is suddenly coming along and taking over their incredibly massive religious institution that's been running for centuries. Interesting. So they have to say it is Satan that is at work here. Jesus quite rightly in turns around and says, sorry, how can Satan cast out Satan? That means it's a house divided against, it's a kingdom divided against itself. It can't possibly stand. That's true, isn't it? Any internal family feuding that could happen? The family doesn't stand for very long, does it? It splits very quickly. If a church has feuding in between it going on, it won't stand for very long. Just thought we'd throw that one. Not that we're feuding. I just, just <laughs> Let's just not think, get away again that churches don't feud. Unfortunately, they do. Why? Well, normally out of selfish pride and selfish ambition. And Jesus is obviously saying here, and using this power that says, listen, the only, per only person who can bind up and take over a strong person is an even stronger person. Is that not true? Yes. Therefore, then, the only person who can bind up Satan surely has to be God. And therefore, then, if I am casting out demons and bringing healing, I've got to be stronger than Satan. Therefore, then, it has to be God's power. Now, this is the point I like to make out of this. How many times do we somehow, when we're in trouble, or we see Satan at work, or we just decide things are going on, we somehow think that God, Jesus, is not powerful enough? How does that work? Because somebody tell me that. Why is it we see the problem before us, and that becomes bigger than Jesus? I just want you to reflect on that for a minute. Something comes our way. First thing, most of... I say this knowing I do it myself, and I know others do it, <clears throat> is that becomes the big issue. We forget that's bigger than Jesus all of a sudden. And we forget that bit. <coughs> and that he is bigger. Yes? So I just want to note that for here. So Jesus is making it very clear. And this is before his death and resurrection. That he is stronger than, yes, through the power of the Holy Spirit, because it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus was doing all these things. Not in Jesus' own divinity. He was doing it with the power of the Holy Spirit. So I just wanted to make that out here. So 
So, so far what we've got, we've got his family thinking he's out of his mind and trying to stop him. We've got the religious law, don't want to give up their power, they're trying to stop him. They're, he's then saying, well, I can't be stopped, because I'm bigger and better than Satan is. It's going well so far, this sandwich, isn't it? Anyone want to take a bite out of it so far? And this is the next thing I want to get to, 28 to 30. I tell you the truth, all sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. He told them this because they were saying he's possessed by an evil spirit. Okay, here is the verses that cause probably some of the most greatest pastoral distress in people. So let's try and alleviate some of the anxiety around these. You read that, you're going to say there is an unforgiven sin, isn't there? It's the great quote, the unforgiven sin. Well, let's go. Firstly, the religious teachers were stating that what Jesus was doing was satanic. Therefore, they were attributing the power of the Holy Spirit to Satan. This is clearly a sin against God. One that clearly is going to have eternal consequences because they are rejecting the very God who can save them by stating and believing that it is Satan at work. Any blasphemy, any sin against God can be forgiven when repentance is sought for. But that forgiveness is brought through Jesus. And he was brought back to life by the power of the... Okay. Therefore, to say that the power of the Holy Spirit is from Satan is to say that Jesus is from Satan. Therefore, the saving grace of Jesus to be forgiven for your sins is not possible because you don't believe he's from God. You're going to believe he's from? So you can't be forgiven some, your sins if you're looking at asking for forgiveness of sins if you're attributing the Holy Spirit to That's where that comes from. Now, it's a little bit more nuanced than that, but in our post-death and resurrection of Jesus, it makes life a lot easier if we just understand that point. Now, this is where the next bit comes. What then happens is people take this, because we forget what's going on, is it's just the religious teachers of law that's saying he's possessed by an unclean spirit. But we take this and then we say there may be work workings of the Holy Spirit in people's lives today. We see something happening and we go, that's not of God. That can't be of God. Basically, sphere kicks in. Seeing God do something can cause fear in people, can't it? And then we start going, no, that's not of God. And then you read these verses and you start thinking, I've just committed the eternal blasphemous sin. I can never be forgiven because I've named something at some point in my life as being not of God when it was later on. If you're one of these people who worries that you've committed the eternal sin, the unforgivable sin, which is naming something of God, is, is, and it, and, sorry, seeing something of God and saying it wasn't, if you're concerned about that right now, guess what? You haven't committed it because you're too bothered and concerned about it that you have. Do you understand the point? The religious leaders weren't concerned. They were an ongoing, persistently denying the power of the work of the Holy Spirit through Christ. So, of course, if they're going to keep denying that Jesus is the risen Messiah and he's come back, what's going to happen? They can never be forgiven, can they? So if you think at some point you have committed this and you're really worried about it, then don't worry about it. Because the fact you're bothered by it means you haven't. <laughs> Do you get the... And I will say this to you. I have no idea the amount of... Over the years, I have heard people go, I think I have committed this... I am, cannot be forgiven. I've committed the unforgivable sin. Are you bothered by it? Really am. Then you haven't committed it. It's that simple. If you really think you're that bothered, just say right now, please forgive me, Lord, in the name of Jesus, and then you forgive him. Move on. 
There really is that simple. We can see stuff at work and say, well, I'm not sure if that's of God, you know. And it turns out later like on it is. And we process it. But it doesn't mean that's the unforgivable sin. That's called doubt. That's okay. So if you ever hear anybody ever thinking they've done that and they're really distressed and worried about it, just say, don't bother, you're worried about it, you haven't. If you think you've done it, look in the mirror and go, no, I haven't. And you're all sitting there thinking, oh, no, no, you that can't be that many people. You'll be amazed. It's if you're constantly opposing God in the way that saying that somebody's doing something, saying this is not of God, and you're, it's a consistency. It is a stubborn heart consistency. That's when you've got a problem. You happy with that? No. <laughs> Did you understand it? Yeah. Oh, that's all right then. So let's go to the other slice of bread. Then Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him. They stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. There was a crowd sitting around Jesus and someone said, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Who are my mother? Who are my brothers? And it's sisters as well, by the way, in the Greek. Just thought I'd mention this. And he looks, these are my mothers, these are my brothers, these are my sisters. Anyone who does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. His own family wants to bind him up. They clearly want to get him outside and have a word. What do you think you're doing? You've gone la-la land. You joke, but that's what would have been going on. Please, please understand, his own family wouldn't have sat there in great awe of Jesus. All right? This is their brother. This is their son. It's just Jesus. We played with him. Had rough and tumble on the ground with him. It's Jesus. They think he's absolutely had it. And I love this with Mark because there is a clear thing here. That the blood family are on the outside and they can't get in. But the sinners who know they are sinners are on the inside, right up to Jesus. Being blood family doesn't mean that you're saved. It's a true humility response to Jesus that makes you part of his family, not osmosis. You can grow up in a Christian household, unless you make that personal commitment yourself, you ain't saved. You're not on the inside. But let's look at the family and what they're doing to Jesus. He's grown up with his family. They've seen him become a man, gone through with him his learning of a craft, supported his education to become a rabbi teacher of God's word probably even gone to his rabbi ordination stroke graduation how proud they must have been of their Jesus probably thought he was going to follow then his dad into the trade but no he starts talking all kind of weird authority stuff starts to shake up the status quo makes it a little bit more radical a little bit more potent teaching Starts dealing and tackling with demons and healing people and challenging the authority of the established traditions. How quickly his family turn against him. Now we know the outcome is in the end, they get it. We do know that, but this is in the early stages. So just imagine for a minute, somebody within your own friendship group, your own family, or somebody you've known you've seen grow into a new role that God has given them, and they're going on about stuff, and you're thinking, they've gone la-la land. This can't be of God, there's something wrong here. But actually, 
It is. You just need to wait and see the outworking of it happening. It's so easy with people we know really well to miss God at work in them. Because we carry a whole bunk of baggage with us. Things may look familiar, doesn't mean they always are. And St. Jesus' right, right, correct quote is, anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Coming to church doesn't make you part of God's family. Doing his will does. Anyway, let's carry on. I'm now going to read 20 verses again. Mark chapter 4. Once again, Jesus began teaching by the lake shore. You've got to understand with Mark, Mark what Mark is now doing is just putting key things that have happened in, 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 in slots. He's not, he's not, this is all one day. He's taking things that have happened and is slotting them together. But there's a reason for him doing that. Believe it or not, what we've just gone through is now going to flow into this. Once again, Jesus began teaching by the lake shore. A very large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Then he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore. He taught them by telling many stories in form of parables, such as this one. Now this is the well-known one. This is in all three Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke. You all know this one, and probably at this point, everybody's going to go, well, shut off now. We know, the, we know the answer to this one. Hmm, I wonder. Listen! A farmer went out to plant some seed. As he scattered it across his field, some of the seed fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon wilted under the hot sun, and since it didn't have deep roots, it died. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants, so they produced no grain. Still, other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they sprouted, grew, and produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even a hundred times as much as had been planted. Then he said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Later, when Jesus was alone with the 12 disciples, note that this is now later, they're not on the lake shore, they are together on their own. The others were gathered round and they asked him what the parables meant. He replied, you are permitted to understand the secret of the kingdom of God. But I use parables for everything I say to outsiders so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they, see, when they see what I do, they will learn nothing. When they hear what I say, they will not understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parables? Isn't that a really nice teacher? What do you mean you don't understand this one? How are you going to not get the rest? The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and take it away. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, the desire for other things, so no fruit is produced. And the seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60 or even a hundred times as much as had been planted. A 
Firstly, it's a parable. As I said, it's a parable that's in both Matthew and Luke as well, in slightly different form, but pretty much following the same. Mark is the most difficult version of this parable to unpack. I really am grateful. Parables are clearly a way of telling a truth to people in a way that is most usefully common to them, using useful common language. Being a farming, agricultural, can't pronounce the word, area and nation, he's using language that I understand. I've got to say to us these days, we sort of use films or music of way of describing something to try and get a truth across using something that we can all connect with. Don't panic, I'm not coming out with a film right now. And Jesus, this is the only extensively explained parable by Jesus and what its meaning. And most people take this and say, ah, Jesus is talking about evangelism. When we go and preach the gospel to people, this is the reaction we will get. And that's what, you all take this bit as meaning. Most people can do that. And it's about, go and tell people, and these are your three responses. The footpath people are those whom Satan has deceived and they just don't follow Jesus. They just ignore it. And Satan has blocked them understanding. The seed on rocky soil is a flash in the pan type people. They hear it. They're quite joyful at the news, but it really doesn't go any deeper than that. And they just fall back to their old way of life, not really responding to Jesus. The thorns are really for those sort of Christians whose life worries, job security, money, stuff desire. And they sort of half are maybe connecting with church but don't make a full commitment. They fall into the trap of relying upon humans to sort them out. And lastly, there's those who accept Christ as their saviour and they go for it. Evangelism. Spreading the gospel. These are your responses. Well, that's true of verses 3 to 9, but it's not true of the explanation afterwards. Why? Well, Jesus, when he's doing 3 to 9, where is he? He's on a boat, talking to everybody that's before him, scattering God's word, whoever's there in the crowd. When he's explaining, who's he with? disciples. We'll pack that in a moment. But the key point in this whole, by the way this is basically another sandwich almost, the key point here is this. When he's alone with his disciples, he says you are permitted to understand the secret of the kingdom of God. I use parables to the outsiders so that scriptures might be fulfilled. When they see what I do, they'll learn nothing When they hear what I say, they'll not understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven. Jesus is taking a quote, sorry, Mark and Jesus taking a quote from Isaiah 6, 9 to 10. And when you read that, you could be saying, well, Jesus is saying that he teaches in parables deliberately to stop people believing in him. He says, I'll just use parables just to, to the outsiders. And I do it, so basically, by quoting this Isaiah... We want them to understand. Because if they do understand, they might turn to me and be forgiven. It's there. Do you read that correctly? That's exactly what that says if you read that in that format. Then one would say, well then what is the point of Jesus coming to earth in the first place if that's what he meant? No, the point that Mark is making, Jesus was making, is that there are those who are hard of heart by their own choice. They see and hear what Jesus is doing the same, but refuse to respond to him rightly. They are actually of hard of heart. So he has to use parables for those that God has already enlightened and lifted up, and they will start to see it. If you have got a heart of heart, you are not going to respond to Jesus. Judas Iscariot was absolutely key example. That's why he's at the end of verse 19 before we go into other people's responses. Judas spent three years with Jesus, seeing everything he was doing, listening to all his teachings. After three years of that close contact, he still portrayed him. 
Hard of heart. Teachers of the law, hard of heart. It's there before them, but they're so selfishly want to hold on to their own power, they're going to block out anything that even can remotely make them admit this is actually of God and this is a good thing and let's get involved. His own family, hard of heart. They couldn't see beyond the little boy Jesus that they knew. Jesus is saying, if you're going to be that hard of heart, like Pharaoh was hard of heart with Moses, you ain't going to get it anyway until you learn to let go of your hardness, until you learn to actually say, well, maybe I need to just drop my thinking. You're not going to understand the kingdom, even if it's described to you in clear, simple language sometimes using parables helps to get underneath the hardness of heart helps get behind some truths being honest how many times now I could ooh, hmm, it's a bit dangerous saying this now you read your bible and it's plain and clear as day there in front of you but you haven't changed it's not quite sunk in Yet all of a sudden you could be watching some movie or reading some other book that's not Christian. Whatever that looks like. Yeah? And all of a sudden it dawns on you. Because there's something in there that's being described that almost picks up what you've read in the Bible. And then it sinks in. It's the same thing. Do you know something? I will be honest with you. Late 90s, Jesus could have been telling me no end I was saved. People could have been coming up saying, Warren, you're saved, you're going to heaven, you're sorted, don't you worry. I went away for a week, Christian conference, it was going on, banging on, it was going on, my life, it was unbelievable. Wasn't fully going into my heart, into that shalom place I needed it. Sitting down, then watching the movie, Deep Impact, as the asteroid hits the earth and people start dying, I start bursting into tears. Do you know why? It was at that moment I realised I was saved. Parable. Parables are great. Modern day parables are ones that we need because we're in it. Anyway, I better get on. 14 to 20. 14 to 20, this is where he's now with the disciples. And actually, this is not about evangelism. This is about you as a disciple. You'll note this. In verse 15, in the NLT, it says... The farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. Verse 15, the seed changes its status. It's no longer the word, it changes. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message and then it turns into disciples. This is not now evangelism. The NLT doesn't quite rendition it correctly. The NIV does. This now for Jesus, as he's talking to his own disciples, is saying, these are your different reactions to the word of God after years of going to be walking with me. This whole description is Mark trying to say, it's all about hearing and what happens once you've heard something from the gospel or you've heard something in your own walk with Jesus. Especially in relation to improving your character. Character is different from personality, by the way. There are three types of hearing here. Those from whom Satan steals the word. They've heard something, but Satan immediately whips it away and they forget about it. There's those with no root and they fall into difficulty and they forget everything they've learnt. There's those who want wealth and worldly desires, choke up what they've heard and it doesn't actually produce anything. 
All of these three things are described in the aorist tense, which means, very simply, that you've listened to it in a simply superficial way, what you have been taught. It basically goes in one ear and out the other. You don't bother to reflect on it or make it part of your life. Let us give you an example. Could be a Sunday morning. And God has just pointed out something to you during the teaching time. Yeah, they're all coughing now. <coughs> Hooray! <laughs> huh. you want to go deaf now? And you go and you sit there and you go, yes, I hear you, Lord. And then the minute you walk out that front door, whoomph, it's gone. Could be Bible study group. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was brilliant. Oh, wow, what John taught us there was fantastic. Walk out his front door and it's gone. Jesus is calling. <laughs> Maybe listen to something on Premier Radio or whatever radio station you might listen to. You walk out the door, it's gone. Or you reflect on something and you get really emotional and tears are streaming down your eyes and you come forward for prayer. But because your roots aren't deep enough in it, it withers and dies and disappears the minute you walk out the door and you're back to the same cycle again next week coming forward with tears over something even though somebody might have prophesied over you or said something really deep and you're like yeah so emotional but it's just emotion not you reflecting on it and what it really means deeply you could have sat with your pastor in his office and something's really come across and you go yes you walk out of his door shake his hand give him a hug and it's gone. By the way, I wasn't just talking about me, all right? Here, in this moment, the real hearers, the one who's actually heard, acknowledged, and taken on, are those where it has actually fell on good soil. Those who are open to actually wanting to truly be changed, who don't want to ignore that little error in their life. I think earlier on when I asked the question, how can we bind Jesus? And it was that, well, sometimes we can sort of say, not give him all of our lives, not give him every area to work in. That can be the rock is just under that bit of soil. But here, the real hearers implement what they have truly learned. They repent of something or they really take something on board that says, yes, I know that Jesus loves me. And they run in that. And then they produce a harvest that is 30, 60 or 100 fold. This is a word that's not really liked. Discipleship actually does require effort. Anybody have a relationship with a partner or a friend? Who, ha who has a relationship with a friend? Okay, if you're not, do you not have any friends? <laughs> I won't understand Timmy, but there's not anybody... <laughs> Uh, no, I won't go into it. Anyway, moving on. Huh? No, no, I can't do it to him, Ola. No, that'd be unfair. What him talking about? Your... Anyway, no. <laughs> he nearly didn't have a wife by this morning. Right, so, but who's got a friend? Come on. You got friend. Was it easy having that friend as a relationship, a really deep friend? Was it really easy? Did it require effort? Yes. Both parts to have the relationship. To learn about each other. Yeah? To get through the rubbish sometimes that we put there. Yeah? It is the same with Jesus. You have to have put a bit of effort in to the relationship. How did you have effort with that friend of yours? Was it spending time with them? Taking time out? Yeah? Yeah? Going for a Costa coffee or Starbucks or any other make and coffee, whatever. But actually, the point is, you have to take time out to spend time with friends, don't you? Or you don't have any. It's the same 
with Jesus. You have to take time out. It takes effort. And him and effort. Now, how did you learn about your friends? They're here. They're here, here. You're listening to them, aren't you? This whole passage, if you talk, is the central point is about hearing Jesus. Discipleship is about listening to No, no, listening to Joe Bloggs. It's listening to Jesus. This is what this passion is about. You want to grow as a disciple, develop your relationship with. Allow him to work in your life. Being hard of heart ain't going to work. Being hard ground, shallow soil with rocks underneath is not going to work. Emotionally taking something on board, but the minute you walk out the door, you've got now Tesco's. Got to go to Tesco's in a minute, or Sainsbury's, or Waitrose, or whoever's posh. Mm, got to do the hoovering when I get home. Oh yeah, I'm really looking forward to going out with night with so and so. I think I'll have lamb sarg and an arm bread. And oh, that's me. Sorry. Um, <laughs> minute that you walk out that door, go. Oh, I must wash the car. Yeah, yeah, better tidy that room up. Oh, my bank balance is not very good at the moment. That's not me, but I'm just, just, just... just <laughs> before you, you think your pastor's moaning about his bank balance, he's not. Yeah, I've really got to do that as well. Oh, man, I've got to pay the insurance. Actually, I'm not quite sure if I can afford a full meal today. Yeah, I'm not really sure about that. Notice the point? That's the worries of this world, choking what you've just heard. And that can happen on a Sunday morning. That can happen after your house group. Oh, house group. Oh, God really came down. Oh, man, that was brilliant. But the minute you walk out, you don't reflect on it. You don't write it down in a journal. You don't make a note of it. Or you don't later on process it a bit more. And listening to Jesus saying to you, this is what this means. This will change your character. This will develop you as a disciple of the living Lord Jesus Christ. It takes effort. Like any good friendship relationship, it takes time out. And this is what he's saying. Those who want to produce a crop of 30, 60, even 100 fold, just be good soil. Just develop the relationship. Carve out time. Plow out time. If you're a farmer, you plow the field. You take the time to plow the field. That's how you get the good soil. So plow out the time. And to conclude, you'll be grateful to know. I want to quote with this, and I love this quote. This made me laugh. Because we are falling into a trap, I would suggest, of thinking being disciples of Jesus is, can be easy. And it should be easy. And we also sit there with this sense of, as long as I get my spiritual infill on a Sunday morning, I'm done for the rest of the week. But I want to look good as well. And this is it from Snodgrass. Great name. Snodgrass. He's a brilliant theologian. Like, honestly, you should read his books. They're brilliant. Anyway, Snodgrass. People think they can look like giant oaks without putting down deep roots. When they realise how much effort it takes to put down deep roots, they too often settle for being bramble bushes. I'll read that again. Remember, this is in the, in the context of being able to bind Jesus' ministry, the church's ministry. People think they can look like giant oaks without putting down deep roots. Deep roots for me, reading the word of God, spending time with Jesus in prayer, spending time discussing, allowing God to minister to you, and change you. Those are the deep roots. That takes effort. Anybody had to dig out a deep tree with its roots, take out the stump? Anybody here ever had to do that? I know some of you in this room because I've helped you do it. Yeah? Those roots, boy, do they go down far. That's some serious effort. Being in a relationship with Jesus isn't hard if you allow 
the effort to put in. Take the time out. That's all it's really about. It's taking time out. Not allowing it to be crowded by other things. So, people think they can look like giant oaks without putting down deep roots. When they realise how much effort it takes to put down deep roots, they too often settle for being bramble bushes. And those of us with deep roots, how joyful it is when you've got them. Because you're not easily shaken when trouble and wind comes your way. It's worth ploughing for. So it's about hearing Jesus, listening to Jesus, spending time with Jesus. Now I'm going to do a really shameful plug. This is about as shoehorned in as I could possibly make it. Starting the 1st of February, Monday the 1st of February, 8 o'clock from 8 till 9, there is what we are calling, well I've decided we're calling anyway, Corporate Shekinah Evenings. You want to know what Shekinah means? You go and find out. It's on the website. Go to the church events diary. It's about being in the presence of the glory of God. Listening to him. And in this case, in also, for want of a better phrasing, imploring him for our community. Not the church, community out there. But it's primarily to be in his presence and to listen to him. They will be starting Monday, the 1st of February, and they'll be happening every Monday. This is something we, as the leadership and staff team, believe that was of God, that we heard him very clearly, because we finally have, we're listening to him, and it's to come in. We've had prophecies since 1998, talking about, how can you hear me if you do not listen to me together? So, I don't want to say you should turn up, but I would suggest you make an effort to turn up to at least some of them, if not all of them. Myself, the leadership team, we're not always going to be able to make every single one. Let's live in a world that's real. Some of us have holidays, might be sick, or I've got to do something else. But definitely there's going to be always, initially, the majority of, I mean, some of the leaders actually work away from here. They're actually two hours drive from here when they're working during the week. But there is something we want to develop, us coming together for an hour to listen to God. The reason we're not calling it a prayer evening is because that has wrong connotations. It's about being in the presence of God and... That's a shameful plug, given this uh, sermon, but um, I make no apologies for it. Right. So let's do that now. Let's listen to God for yourself out of today's teaching. Just listen to the Lord for yourself. I'm not praying it for you. Don't walk out of here forgetting and letting it disappear what he has said. God bless you all. Have a blessed week. Have a gas, gas, gas. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.